who most of you know, who is the founder of CDX, which is part of our taxonomy ecosystem. Uh, he and I are going to sort of co-host this afternoon. Uh, we're going to start with Malcolm Frank, who is the head of digital business at Cognizant, which is a global software and consulting firm. He, he has incredibly diverse interactions with businesses um, and has a hugely broad perspective, which I I hope you will agree once you hear him talk. Uh, some of you may have heard him at our recent Health and Wealth of America conference. And some of the issues we touched on there, we may, we may reprise, but I'm hoping we'll go even broader because I know he's got some really good uh, big picture observations about what's happening in society. But just to further introduce him, aside from his major responsibilities at Cognizant, he's written several really interesting books that have done very well. One. Most recently, what to do when machines do everything, how to get ahead in a world of AI algorithms, bots, and big data. And he wrote that in 2017 when some of those phrases were a lot less common than they are today. And in 2014, he wrote a book called Code Halos, which is a very creative title, how the digital lives of people, things, and organizations are changing the rules of business. So we'll come into some of that in this discussion as well. Um, I think, um, and maybe before we start, um, I, I would just say we're here to talk about the year past and the year ahead, uh, which unquestionably, this has been, many would say, the worst year of our lives, certainly the most challenging, the, the quite fundamentally different from any other year. So there's a lot to say about 2020. Um, and maybe before we go to Malcolm, I just invite Drew to make any observations about 2020. And then, oh, I would should say, then we're gonna be joined by Rita McGrath, a great business and, and societal thinker from Columbia Business School. And Drew's gonna have an interaction with her when she shows up, which will be a little bit later because she had a conflict to get started right at the beginning. Um, and then uh, we'll, but we throughout, we wanna hear from you. We want the audience to be telling us what they think and asking questions actively. So please put them in the chat and uh, we may put you on audio to ask them depending on what it is and all that. So just Drew, quick thoughts on 2020 and 2021. Sure, thanks David, Malcolm, welcome. Um, and welcome to everybody who's attending today. Uh, well, I definitely wanna hear mostly from Malcolm and Rita on this. Uh, and, but, you know, I, I think as I've said before, I'm, I'm you know, with a bit of a marketing and agency and sort of consumer background a little bit, I'm always interested in how, you know, consumer behavior may shift um, for whatever reason. But particularly now, um, I think the old adage of it takes habits 40 days to form or something like that around there. And here we are, it'll probably be a full year of, of habit changing and not just sort of a move and comfortable with e-commerce and those types of things, but real fundamental shifts, not only in consumer behavior, but also what the new normal of work culture will look like, um, people in the office, people remote, and then how that affects sort of work culture and driving innovation and transformation. So I suppose in a, in a macro level, I'm always most interested in how um, fundamentally people may change and very interested in hearing what Malcolm has to say about that and then, and then Rita when, when she comes on shortly. Thanks, Drew. So Malcolm, welcome. Um, thank you for, for joining us. Malcolm's going to have to leave at 1.30. So we have a a little bit of a sequential session today, but two really great big thinkers. Um, so Malcolm, I mean, when you look at 2020, what, what do you think? Is, is that too big of a question to start with? No, it's a, uh, I, look, I, I think like all of us, I've just been thinking, how do I get through this day? How do I get through this week? And just put one foot in front of the other. But, you know, it's, it's remarkable how we look back and say, this has been nine months and you may have seen, you know, Google is now instructing its associates that, uh, hey, we're not coming back to the office until September. And you know, who knows more than Google about this topic? So, uh, you know, it's, it, David, this feels like if, if you're taking one of those flights, you know, transatlantic flights, and you pass out like Paris to New York and you go to sleep, into, you're out for the first two hours and you sort of wake up and you're thinking, gosh, we must be over Nova Scotia by now. Like we must be over Boston. And you look at the map and you're like, oh, holy hell. Like, you know, we're not even halfway there. Um, I think that's how we have to 
think about where we are with this COVID journey, in spite of the fact that you know the, the vaccines are being distributed now. Um, but you know what what strikes me the most is, and this gives me a little bit of solace. I think we have been through this before, um, and you know some of us now we are probably too young to really recognize it. But 1968 and 2020 have a lot of parallels. Um, if you consider pandemic, the Hong Kong flu killed between one and four million people that year. You know, COVID is now up to 1.6 million. So there's a real parallel there. And in fact, you know, per capita, the Hong Kong flu was, was more dangerous. Um, you know, that was obviously the year that Martin Luther King was assassinated. You know, we had George Floyd uh, this year and the, the race riots that followed those. Um, recession, you know, the slump it started in 68 and led into 69. Of course, we've had recession this year and then um, both were election years. And so all of these issues got greatly dialed up in the zeitgeist. Um, and in both cases, we elected senators or former senators whose last names were with five letters. Uh, let's, let's hope that that's where the similarities end on the political fronts. But, um, you know, it's, it's uh, with all of that parallel, you know, hey, maybe we're in for a decade of, uh, really horrible music and fashion and architecture the same way we had in the 70s. But, um, you know, I, I think of the parallels um, and it, it gives me hope that society has lived through this before and uh, you know, we're, we're going to get to the other side of this one. Well, I know you even see parallels to other more draconian moments in history. Um, you know, talk about th this whole issue of social division and inequality and the parallels you see to the past and where we stand in, in, in that stuff. Yep, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because I think there is um, actual division and perceived division. And it's really important because we, we focus on the latter instead of the former. Um, you know, if, if you've read Factfulness and Hans Rosling, you know, he, he in a, as he does in an inimitable style, walks through all of the reasons we should be very optimistic about the progress we've made with income inequality, getting rid of poverty, getting rid of disease, so forth and so on, that this is a 2020, you know, in spite of everything, or when he wrote it in 2019, we've made remarkable progress on these things. And yet when you go online, you get in these echo chambers where you can start to see, um, I, I think often as the internet is the huge, as the a jealousy machine and the rage machine. And you could look at the lives of others and go, oh, the, holy, this is BS. How do they live that way? And I live this way and I don't like that. And, you know, David, we often think when we were writing one of our books that this reminds us a great deal of the time we're in now of Belle Epoque. That, you know, during Belle Epoque, you made the, the Paris Fair of the time and standing up the Eiffel Tower that, industrialization was going to solve problems that had, that had been with society forever. And it was going to be a new age of peace and a new age of tranquility and uh, equality. And of course, that was followed up pretty quickly by World War I and then uh, the horrors of World War II and the Cold War. And so, you know, are we able to deal with this level of change in this compressed period of time? And we have all of the wonders of digital technology. We don't need to wax poetic about that. You know, I'd leave that for the John Perry Barlow's. But, but um, if, if you look just this week, you know, look at what Russia did across the US um, with digital technology. So um, I think like anything, it's a force for incredible good. It's a force for evil. And you know, the question is during these times when everything is so dialed up, you know, how do we manage that balance? much better than we managed it in the past? I think it's a huge question in front of us. Do you, do you think there's a um, substantial, I mean, how bad do you think it is for everything you're talking about that such a substantial portion of society feels, I don't know whether the word is alienated or disgusted, or it is just the sheer matter of division. And, you know, this, this issue of, some people feel that I mean, maybe it's this, maybe the question I'm asking is about the fundamentally different versions of reality that people are, are holding at the moment. But um, would that be comparable to what, say, you know, people felt in the Industrial Revolution feeling increasingly alienated? Um, give me a little more on that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, if, if you look at, 
what happened back then you had different societies advancing at very different rates and so it was this great game of catch-up that really drove all of that um, but that's now happening more at a micro level and uh, Andy McAfee at MIT turned me on to this a long time ago this is probably 10 12 years ago but he was showing data um, of Amazon readers and the books they recommended to their networks and their friends and it was very clear back then that there was a blue America and a red America that had evolved. And those Venn diagrams, they didn't even overlap. And so these were completely different intellectual journeys that America was on. Um, and then of course you throw in um, gerrymandering and cable television and then the internet and social media. And boy, that's a lovely cocktail. Um, so, you know, on one hand, Let's just say you know, we, we've had a stunning lack of proper leadership through these times from our national national leaders, whether that's in the White House or in Congress. Um, so there's a vacuum there, but that vacuum is being filled with these digital perceptions, which don't even overlap. And you've seen this. You will see after an election where people will say, I can't even believe that somebody voted for X because I don't know one person that would have voted for that person. So how is it possible they got 60, 70 million votes? That is a manifestation of this society that can no longer talk to one another. And this is not an American phenomenon. You know, I think big picture, if we really explain what's happened in Turkey, what's happened in Russia, what's happened with Brexit, what's happened in France, um, you know, it's, it's, th this is a worldwide phenomenon and I think technology is at the heart of the whole thing. Um, wow. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's it seems like you know, for, for the many many of us who you know, the CNBC and CNN watchers, MSNBC, maybe CNBC too, uh, watchers. Uh, it 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 seems like oh, these people can't possibly believe there was this much electoral fraud. And yet, I, I think increasingly, um, it, it is clear that they really do believe it, and the president really believes he was robbed, um, and 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 that portends some scary stuff. And I don't know what the connection of it is to this Russian um, cyber attack. But I, I'm, I'm in my head, I think there there must be. It is the the, the consequences of a digital society. Certainly, that's a simple connection. Um, but there, it's on, it, it, it is, I'll tell you, here's another way I think of it, just for the record. It's the consequences of a digital society that is not governed as a digital society. That's right, that's right. Right, and, and it is amazing, this Russian attack is being said to be the worst cyber attack ever in history on anybody. That's increasingly evident, and I think probably will prove to be more and more true with each passing day. Um, I wanted to recalibrate my promise about the session because Malcolm, you can in fact stay till one. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can stay. I apologize, yeah. I got that wrong because I guess that was just determined very immediately shortly before we got started and I missed it. And I, I've been corrected by Josh. Um, meanwhile, uh, Rita has arrived uh, uh, now and if, if, if Malcolm will um, tolerate this, and if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to bring Rita in now so we can make this more of a conversation. Yep, let's but, do it. And so, so I'm gonna ask Drew to introduce Rita, but then I, I want to go back to Malcolm after Rita's fully in the conversation, and I wanna shift a little bit more to a forward spin on 2021. Um, but go ahead, Drew, and, and bring Rita in. And hi, Rita. Great to see you, and uh, great to have you join us as always. Um, I know we'll, we'll roll right back into the conversation here, but I'd like, at least like to have you introduce yourself um, and, and what your focus is over there at Columbia. I know you've written a couple of books as well, and then we'll dive sure. back into the conversation. So uh, uh, I'm Rita McGrath. I'm a professor at Columbia Business School. My main focus is executive education. Uh, my most recent book, for once I got the timing right, it was called Seeing Around Corners, and it's about strategic inflection points. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. And David, I'll let you continue rolling with Malcolm and oh. let's all make it interactive here and get the audience involved as well. Yeah, Drew, you, you just chime in as, as, as you feel, see fit. Um, well. well, maybe on the strategic inflection point, let, let, 
say why you think this is one, Rita, and then maybe I'll ask Malcolm to, to respond to that, and then we'll maybe go to the forward spin stuff. Sure. Well, we've actually got four coming together. So I define a strategic inflection point as something that happens in the external environment that exerts a 10x pressure on some aspect about your business. So it changes the taken for granted assumptions in your business in some quite dramatic way. And we've got four going on, right? So we've got a global pandemic. We've got an economic crisis. We've got a crisis of social justice and then bubbling underneath all of it is a climate crisis that are all mixing in hard to, uh, hard to sort out ways. And uh, the reason I think it's an inflection point is even if we have a get vaccine, you know, there are going to be some things that are going to take a long time to get back to where they were or maybe forever altered. Yeah, well, very succinctly said, by the way, thank you. I mean, Malcolm had earlier said before you arrived that, you know, we're like on a transatlantic flight where we wake up and think, oh, we must be already over Canada, but in fact, we're still in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, <laughs> so Malcolm, say anything, but I mean, I, I'd love to just hear you talk about whatever has been vetted in the last few sentences. Yeah, well, first, uh, Rita, great to see you again. Great to see you um, again, absolutely. I'm glad you yeah. two know each other. Really, really looking forward to this. Uh, you know, I think where we were, David, just before Rita joined, um, is that we are unambiguously moving to a digital society and it's starting to govern how we communicate, how value is created by corporations, uh, so forth and so on. And so I think this Russian hack, it's interesting. If you were to, when people, if Wikipedia exists in 2035 and people look that up, it will look Pearl Harbor-ish. It will really look stunningly aggressive. Um, and yet some people still view it through an industrial old school lens and think, well, uh, okay, I, I don't quite understand what that was. And so what? They got in a few systems, who cares? Um, and the re reason I raise that is we're viewing so many issues uh, through a similar lens. So I think uh, COVID, uh, even though it was the pandemic that was the biggest strategic inflection point that's driving all these others. I think we may look back and say that was the waterline that before that it was pre-digital and after that it's post-digital or it is digital. And um, so it's, it's in terms of how we frame issues and structure things and you know, how we view things through a regulatory lens. You know, back in the 1920s, you know, we would just buy a Ford and you know, there were no speed limits and you know, no traffic lights and no seat belts. And, you know, you could drink a six pack from one city to the next and not think twice about it. Um, and now that's highly regulated and we need to do the same with so many aspects of our digital world. So, you know, I think if, if I view this through a glass half full lens, 2020 was a catalyst where we probably made five years of progress on a lot of those issues in 12 months time. Yeah, very uh, interesting. One follow up. For just a yeah, second. Please. Go ahead, Rita, and then I have a follow up related to that. So please Great. go ahead. Um, so, uh, you know, I think this is a particularly germane because what we're seeing is, and Malcolm, you guys are right at the front edge of this, um, we're seeing value in the economy moving really from products and services to interactions, you know, and most of those are digitally intermediated. So when you talk about a Pearl Harbor type moment, it's acknowledging that, you know, that it's not planes and bombs and um, military installations, it's, it's digitally the equivalent. Um, Rita, I'd love for you to answer this and Malcolm follow up with it, please. Um, Rita, I totally agree with you about multiple inflection points. So true. And, and, and um, management and boards and, and managers of, say, a lot of people or, or business units, just responding to any one of those would be challenging. And, and, What's your advice generally, Rita, and then Malcolm, as you're consulting with your clients? Um, so how does management respond to this? And not so much, okay, consumers are shifting to e-commerce. That's a little more, it's a, it's a macro level subject, but it's more tactical to be baked within all of it. But just how do you respond to strategic inflection points, particularly if they're around crisis or crises? Rita, so any advice for, for management and managers? And then Malcolm, I'd love your input on that as well. Yeah, so I think counterintuitively, the way to respond to a dramatic shift like this is with as little drama as possible. Um, <laughs> what you want to do is recognize that there's just vast amounts of uncertainty and then set out a plan to learn um, in small, quick bites. So, so the rapidity of learning is what you really want to focus on. And you don't want to 
increase the emotional temperature, you want to try to bring it down. Malcolm, thoughts on that? I, I, I think that's the best advice possible that, you know, calm breeds calm. And uh, you, firms need to see what's going on objectively, um, not argue about it, but really comes to grips with it and then figure out what the next steps are to take. And so, you know, we all have shapes of different recessions. I think this may be the K-shaped recession because some firms have figured it out and are, this is going to be the window where they really grab market share and grab leadership and trust with their customers. And it's going to be a window of time where others just fell off the cliff and it was unrecoverable. And it's how you react during these times. Um, and to Rita's point, if, if you get too upset and there's too much adrenaline in the system, you just get cat catatonic or brownie in motion just takes over in the firm and it gets stuck. <laughs> well, but doesn't, doesn't that get even more challenging because the question also has to be overlaid onto this. What is business's responsibility to respond differently, concretely as business and as an individual company because of all these things that are happening? I mean, Techonomy's partnered with the Harris Poll right now, and we've seen presentations in, in publicly in our forums recently that the public in the United States and around the world is increasingly looking to business because they are so dissatisfied with government's response to many of the problems that you've both described. So what? how much is business expected to solve this and how much can they, I mean, this, these many matters, how much is the, are the problems in business's court? I have a point of view on that. I don't know, Malcolm, if you want to go. Yeah, why, don't, why don't you jump in? Why don't you start? Sure. So um, if you go back in, uh, I'll stick to American history and we can talk more globally uh, later, but just American history. Um, we had two moments when business was called to task. Uh, one was in the Great Depression and Franklin Delano Roosevelt made a very stirring speech about uh, a rendezvous with destiny. And what he meant by that was that at that time, you know, the excesses of the 20s, uh, vast amounts of income inequality, um, you know, most of the means of production concentrated in the hands of a very few. And he basically said, we cannot have a free country where there's economic tyranny. And that set the stage for, among certain of his fairly wealthy colleagues, was, was a really un, uh, unappreciated set of policies that, that began to tilt the resource allocation in the country towards more towards the common person. Um, second was after World War II, there was a group of business leaders called um, the Council for Economic uh, Advancement, I think they were called. And they basically said, we've got literally tens of millions of, of warriors coming home from this war and there will be no jobs for them. And you know, like you don't wanna live in a society where tens of millions of people have been trained to kill other people, come back and find that they are destitute, that they have no control over their fates. And they vowed that the number one priority at the time was creating jobs and creating a middle class. And if that meant, you know, a little bit less in the way of corporate profits, or it meant, you know, the shareholders got an adequate but not outsized return, so be it. And that set of policies really was uh, among a, a bunch of things that carried the U.S. economy right through the, I'd say, the mid-70s. Um, and then we started to see a shift where the, the increased uh, flow of resources went really to the top. Um, we saw the advent of trickle-down economics. We saw a lot of policies which essentially concentrated wealth in the hands of those who owned the shares. And now we are reaping some of the results of this because we've hollowed out the middle class in many cases. We've got a mountain of, of awful jobs in, in the country. Um, and I think people are beginning to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we'd like to get some newer version of that post-war consensus uh, established where, you know, we recognize the rights of all stakeholders and the business roundtable has talked about this but you know if you think about it if you're an employee and you give your talent and your skill and your wisdom and your dedication to a firm you are contributing to its value creation if you are a community that provides necessary infrastructure and educates the children of your employees you are contributing and i think we've lost that plot somehow. So most recently, um, Roger Martin, a, a good friend of mine, has written a terrific book, um, and it's called uh, When More is Not Better. And what he argues is that we have broken up our governance of what should be looked at as a system into component pieces. And different people are incentivized to benefit from different elements of those pieces. We're not looking at it as a system. Very interesting. 
Now, yeah, I would just just like to add to that. Um, as we were talking earlier, you know, digital is a catalyst, and when it comes to business, it can catalyze awful things, which is what we're seeing with social media platforms. So, you know, David, it's why I find it fascinating that people are saying, "I'm looking to business to really lead." But you know, this year has been a reminder of what I think of as businesses that stand as the pillars of society, those that are in the healthcare system, those that are in the financial system and our educational systems, um, they can be incredible forces of good going forward. And this is my optimism that if, if we look just a few years from now back, um, we'll be horrified at you know, what we lived through with our healthcare system, that it really is a sick, sick care system as opposed to something that drives wellness and gets to individualized DNA-based one-to-one care. And something that you know, gives me a lot of optimism just this past year, in 2019 in the US, there were 19 million virtual visits with doctors. Um, and there were lots of reasons that the medical community was against this and you know, the payers and the providers. And yet this year we blasted right through that wall. There, there are now more than a billion uh, online visits, and it's just accelerating month on month. So just things like that, um, I, I think, are changing the game and are providing dramatically better outcomes for society. Um, and so this is where I think people are saying, you know, can these corporations focus on what is their main charter and do good through that and get to true stakeholder capitalism? Um, and uh, so I, I agree with Rita on that. And, and I'd like both of you to comment, are CEOs and top managements recognizing that sufficiently in your experience? I think it's all over the map. I mean, I deal with a lot of people in the C-suite and you've got some, that, for example, just today I was talking to Gary Ridge, who's the CEO of uh, WD40. Um, and I mean, he's bought into this from birth, I think, um, as, as the way to go. You know, what you want is great jobs. You want a purposeful company. You want to do good in the world. And you want to see those things uh, drive your corporate growth. And then I've seen CEOs at the complete other end of the spectrum who basically treat their people like, you know, slightly poorly performing robots, uh, <laughs> pay them as little as humanly possible and, you know, try to extract as much as they possibly can from, from the corporation. So I think we've got a big spread. Um, I do think that people are being put more on notice now that that people are watching that the status quo is not working for so many people and you know roger martin makes a great point he says look we we make the assumption that democracy and capitalism go together but if you have a democracy and your capitalist system doesn't work for the majority of your democracy guess what they're going to vote for some other system yeah so it is all over the map and this is true tone from the top it, it varies by what are boards holding the ceo and management team accountable to and it's, it's all over the place right now. And let me give you just, David, one, um, I think, hallmark of 2020 that we'll look back and say it, it was a trigger was the new value equation of cities and states. And the alt city has shown up. So, for example, in financial services, there's obviously New York, but now Miami's the alt city. And in music, there's Los Angeles, but now Nashville. And in high tech, there's Silicon Valley, San Francisco, and now it's Austin, Texas. And you know, just being in the tech industry for as long as I have been, um, you know, I've been up and down in every hotel on 101 more times than I care to admit in California. But um, I always thought that Hewlett Packard and Oracle were like, they're physically the bookends of Silicon Valley from Cupertino, you know, right up to the towers. Um, of Oracle near the airport. And to think that in the last six weeks, they've announced that they are leaving, we're out of here. So this gets to the leadership in these times, what's best for employees, what's best for the stakeholders, what's best for the shareholders, because now that is showing up in this new value equation of cities and states. And you know, New York lived through that horrible period in the Koch and Dinkins you know, administrations, um, and then came back to vitality the last 30 years. But it could do that because where were these workers going to go? But now with digital, they can go anywhere. And so when Goldman Sachs Asset Management, a quarter of the firm says, we're moving to Miami and taking all of that tax revenue and all of those workers with it. And Deutsche Bank is saying, we're probably gonna move half of our New York-based employees down to Florida. Um, 
th those jobs, what's the old Bruce Springsteen song? Those jobs are going boys and, and they ain't coming back. And so it's, I think that's a real issue that 2020 will be remembered for as the catalyst of, um, but it gets to this question of, you know, what is the role of these management teams in thinking through in a utilitarian sense, what is the best for most? And you know how do I balance that out? Well, and what's the possibility they'll be punished if they don't think that way in the long run, economically? And 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 what I'd love to sort of shift the gear a little bit, taking all of that big picture thinking that we just had right there. Um, and Reed, I'll start with you, and Malcolm, come back to you as well here. Um, how does this then impact you know the ability to drive innovation and transformation? So it's like okay, maybe the company's headquarters is uprooting. Maybe the staff is going to be semi-virtual, whatever we want to call it. Um, you know, we're going through crisis and managing through crisis and inflection points. So how does that impact the day to day getting in the weeds just a little bit of continuing to drive innovation? Because as as the, the preface just set up, um, it's, it's more pressure, uh, probably less resources for a while. Right. Um, consumer cycles are faster than ever shifting to digital. So how do you how do you drive innovation through this entire process, Rita? And then Malcolm, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think one useful way about thinking about innovation is is in a well managed company, it ebbs and flows. You know, there's going to be times when you don't have the bandwidth or the resources to absorb much innovation. You're you're really about riding the ship. The mistake I see a lot of companies making is they do a stop start. So they'll start innovation. Everybody's all excited. It's innovation theater. You know, we go off to Silicon Valley and we have the tour and get our picture taken next to the Facebook sign and all that stuff. Um, and this goes on for, you know, two, three, maybe four years. And then somebody says, hang on, what's the ROI on this? And they disband the whole thing. And then two years later, somebody says, you know, we need more innovation around here. Let's go to Silicon you know, And it just repeats. Yeah. Right? So it's episodic. Right. Right. So what you don't want is that. Um, what you want is to maintain some level of innovation, even if it's around your base business. Um, and, uh, and, and I think you want to keep that going. Um, innovation is a process and it's, it can be managed as a process with appropriate structures, governance, resources. I actually find in these kinds of crises moments, uh, two interesting things happen. The first interesting thing that happens is people are motivated to go out and find the zombies and finally get rid of them. <laughs> you know, because now that resources are a little more tight, uh, we're, going to, we're going to be a little more careful about what we invest in. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that it unfreezes so many assumptions that things that were not possible before now become possible and and you know even even enjoyable and even prosperous. So you know, second cities is one, right? Um, so I think the the oh and, and I guess maybe a third thing is that when you're facing unprecedented uncertainty, the only way through it is by innovating. So it's almost not an option. Right, Malcolm. Thoughts on that in terms of you discussed with your clients and all of your clients are trying to innovate, and you guys have done a phenomenal job of, of helping them drive digital transformation. What's your What's your either lessons you're learning as you're working with your clients through this time and what you're advising them to do as there is all this uncertainty all the way to the point of where are our offices and where are our people um, to drive this kind of innovation that's necessary, is mandated. Yeah, well, I, I, I love innovation theater. So uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that one. That's great. Um, and, and, and there's been too much of that. But I'll tell you what, I think one of the things 2020 will be remembered for positively is AI found its business model and particularly on this issue around innovation. And just look at what Moderna and Pfizer and the rest have taken us through. That, that was with AI. Um, enormous data sets, throwing algorithms and, and, and bots at this problem. And so look at you know, the, the tragedy of polio and how many decades it took to find that vaccine um, and HIV that has been with us, what, 35 years? And we have sort of not really kind of addressed it. And now maybe it's just a different virus, but we got this up and down in what, nine months. And it was on the back of massive data sets and then learning at scale. And that is a lesson that corporations can take. It's how can they solve really thorny problems in their markets or in their firms that Maybe in the past they said, hey, it's too hard. It, I, I just have to accept it. I'm gonna walk past it. And now they can address them through a completely new, new manner. So I think you know, applying AI and learning at scale and moving you know, very, very quickly is going to really change this innovation model going forward. 
do either of you have thoughts as a follow-up to that? Again, a little more sort of getting into the weeds um, and, and executing it from a culture standpoint, a work culture standpoint. Silos, we all know about silos and how they can be problematic. Um, but you know, to me, there is a there is a concern. At least with silos, maybe okay. Well, I might see the person in the cafeteria. I might be able to go up two floors and, and go actually talk to somebody and corral them. And, and it, now, like everyone is literally virtual. There's no one in the office. There might not be everyone in the office. And and is there a danger of even more sort of silos being created? Because I'm not even in the same building as this person anymore. At least I could track them down if I needed to to get a hold of them or see them at a monthly social or see them in the cafeteria. What, what about silos and how you work through um, not having all these virtual silos? Do you want me to take that one? Yeah, um, I'll start with it. Um, I, I think there's two pieces of it, Drew. One is access, which has skyrocketed. Um, yeah. And I delight in it, meaning I, I can visit with five clients a day all around the globe and you know not be jet lagged. Who knew? <laughs> right. right. Um, so access has skyrocketed. However, the other piece is trust. And this goes back to the Savannah sitting around the campfire. Do I really trust that person? And it's a very rich word, you know, not just ethically, but are they going to deliver the goods? Have they done this before? Uh, right. Do they have the capability? And that is extremely hard to build in a virtual world. So we're in this weird place where you get the access, but you don't have the trust. And what's hard with a lot of digital initiatives is that if the organization in an industrial age was structured around the silos that you're describing, many digital initiatives go across the silos. And so how do you get those teams that are different tribes to start to work together? Um, in, and so you know, this is getting into virtual agile has really taken off of how do you right. create those virtual agile methods and teams um, to be able to do that in this environment. And there's a lot of tools that support it. So the good news is we've got the tools and the approaches which are very sophisticated now, but I worry that there's still that human element um, which is missing and we got to get back to it. Rita, Rita you want to jump in? Sure, right. so yeah. um, I'll start with a research study and then a couple of best practices. So the research study is some work that was done on scientists and uh, I think his name was Dr. David Allen who did this. And he studied scientist behavior at I think Bell Labs or somewhere like that. Um, and what he found, if you, if you think of sort of imagine information richness on a vertical dimension and distance apart as in distance that we sit apart on the horizontal, uh, he found a curve that looks like this, kind of just a straight, you know, fine, 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 fine. And then boom, drop falls off a cliff. And his conclusion was that within 60 feet, so if people work within 60 feet of each other, very rich information travels effortlessly. We all know what's going on. We're by the water cooler, we bump into each other on our way you know, home or whatever it is. And so information flows really well. Once you're beyond 60 feet, well, 20 meters, um, information richness needs to be constructed. And I think that's true whether you're physically apart and you're pre-COVID time or whether you're on the other side of the world. So if you're beyond 60 feet of normal human interaction, that's where you need to become much more intentional about it. And yeah. there's some great examples of organizations that have done this. One of the best known is probably what Stanley McChrystal did um, in, the, in the military. And what he was in charge of was coordinating all the special operations. So the Navy SEALs and the Red Beret, Green Berets and you know, all these, and they're all tribes, right? They, they all, you know, within their tribe, they trust each other literally to the death, but across the tribe, eh, not so much. And what he realized was that in the fight against Al-Qaeda, he was really dealing with a shape-shifting enemy. There just wasn't time to get to where the coordination mechanisms needed to be. And so what he did was he instituted a daily call, which could have as many as 7,000 people on it. And the purpose of the call was not necessarily to make decisions, it was to share information across these silos, across these groups, and to build trust. And he talks about that very explicitly. He said it, it took a long time before people trusted the process, but it was what allowed them to operate as a unified force in the midst of all this separation. I, I would posit that in addition to AI having come into its own this year, Collaborative technology has come into its own and in some new ways. I, I just wanted to mention a little anecdote. My wife was just finishing up in the other room teaching painting at the School of Visual Arts in New York, which she's done for many years. They've gone completely virtual. She has just is just finishing a semester of teaching painting on Zoom to a class that is scattered literally all over the world. Most of her students are in Asia. 
And she just came in a little while ago and said they were doing better work this year than her students in that class have ever done. And we were talking about why could that possibly be? Because of course she was very skeptical about teaching painting on Zoom, who wouldn't be? She felt that normally they distract each other in class. Who knows why? I mean, I think we're gonna be taking a long time to figure out why certain things work and don't work in these new modalities like the one we're using right now, which we would never have considered doing a year ago, right? So I'm just saying, we're in a new world that has got a lot of promise, but we still are figuring out what the promise is. So that was an observation. I wanna to go to an audience person. Um, J.W. Morris, I'm gonna turn on your ability to talk. So go ahead and make your comment uh, or question and, 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 and let's hear it and identify yourself too, please. Oh, I'm, I'm Jack Morris. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, you can. So uh, I'm uh, kind of relocated this year to uh, Golden, Colorado. I've got a home in Pound Ridge, New York. Uh, my comment back to Dave, which I think this year has been a great piece uh, of a series of things from the Facebook which I thought was Steve Levy was fantastic, Amazon. But really my comment about what's going on now is the lack of public, a lack of trust in public institutions. So um, I was an ex-former military officer. Yes, I know Stan McChrystal from JSOC. Um, I think the larger question is why do we ever go to Iraq and Afghanistan in the first place? So it's nice getting the process, but when you fail on the strategic issue, there's a lack of trust there. I guess we're still there too, spending trillions of dollars. So with the election, do I think there's full transparency? I don't, David, on that. Uh, yeah, I'm conservative. That doesn't mean I'm a, a you know, a complete alt-right. But I just don't believe that what we've seen in our institution 668, I think we had a book discussion on that earlier this year, you know, it's been a decline for over the last uh, 40 years. And so I don't think there's a lot of trust in public institutions to do the, the best for the public, the public good. Let me ask you, Jack, do you see any hope of a change in that? Or where would you point to a, a way to possibly fix or address that? Uh, I think it'd be a full count, um, on this election, specifically be a full counting on the results in each state overall. I think we have to have uh, voter ID. Um, I think we have to have like we've had in Australia, which is mandatory voting. Um, you asked about the question about uh, your wife in a painting, from my experience, when people are actually paying for it, the intentionality, the self-discipline, um, people take things more seriously. And I think we've given things away much too freely that people don't really value it. But your wife is spending time, people are paying for that course, they value it, and they're putting much more time, more hours into the work. Yeah, that's yeah. an interesting point. You gotta From believe the, parents, the yeah. parents of these kids who are paying the same tuition they were paying before in all these colleges, you know, have gotta be yeah. saying, you damn well better be working in that Zoom class. Right. I think that I think that's the point on everything else. It's what's the responsibility of the of the citizen in the country. I think that citizens all around the world, which Malcolm talked about, you know, colleagues I have back back in Germany or the UK or back in Asia, what's the responsibility of each citizen in their respective countries for the common good? Well, thank you for, for that. Um, any Good comments on that? No one wants to touch that one. I don't. Know. Okay. <laughs> um, well, well, no, it's it's I, I, I'll I'll touch it in one sense that um, there's an alien this dichotomy that the digital world has provided that um, we're more in touch with everything, but we think we can impact less of it, and so it's you know a hundred years ago when you would vote, it was down at your community center, you knew everybody, um, there was local touch and you really felt it matters. But then you go online and you think, oh, I'm just one of 330 million and you know, what could I really change? And what, what do my tax dollars change and so forth and so on. And so that, that's where you see, I think, you know, people feeling, I, I really can't uh, impact anything in selfish behaviors, you know, start, start to um, fall in. So it's, it's this very strange perspective that people have on their role of society uh, when they get into these online communities. Well, you know, uh, let's talk about that quickly, th this bigger question of these online companies. I mean, one of the major pieces of news in 2020 has been the beginning of a true massive regulatory assault on the new dominant companies of modern capitalism, both in Europe and, and now in the United States. 
uh, with multiple antitrust cases uh, and, and, and both Europe and the UK proposing new laws that will require penalties of 10% of global revenues if they are not abided by. And, and those laws are not in effect yet, but they're going to have things like that soon. So I just love both of you to comment on where you, what is the trajectory of modern society in relationship to the small number of companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. Um, what are your speculations on where we're going? Well, I want to start with Malcolm. Uh, we'll start or, with okay. Oh, if your, your gut started, go ahead, Rita. Yeah, well, I actually wrote about this in my most recent book. And I basically said, if your business model depends on trickery and you know obfuscation about what you're actually doing under the guise of doing something else, that's inherently really fragile. Um, so that's the first point. Uh, secondly, institutions take time to catch up with developments in technology. So human ingenuity, is faster moving than human institutional capability. And so you saw this with the trust busting back in the, back in the, you know, the 20s and 30s. Um, so new waves of technology that create new ways of doing things and new, new things, they produce consequences nobody really anticipated. And it takes a while until those in the institutional side of things uh, figure it out. So any regime like that takes place is, functioning at a particular point of historical time. And some things are possible and some things are not. And what an inflection point does is it changes what's possible. And so you've got a regulatory regime that's built around the old what was possible. And now you've got a whole new set of possibilities that nobody ever conceived of before. I mean, nobody ever conceived that you could actually have technologies that would be able to follow you literally home and listen in on your conversations you know, 24 seven. I mean, that, that, that was science fiction. Nobody thought of that. And today it's here. And now we're faced with the question of, well, what, what do we do with that? Right. And so I'll close with, uh, with this comment with an analogy uh, that I read about in the book, which was the American Libraries Act, uh, which is an authorization uh, by Congress for the conduct of libraries, public libraries, may had a provision that a librarian may not reveal to anyone what someone coming to the library came to research because that was considered a deep violation of privacy. This is in the Libraries Act. And you know, Google can now tell you what you had for breakfast and that's not considered an invasion of privacy. I find that rather stunning. Um, oh, you know, I wanna just make, before Malcolm speaks, your point about trickery is so timely. If anybody's followed the last couple days news about Facebook's pushback against Apple, what they're saying is that by Apple requiring a, a new rule that apps have to get consumer permission before they can do more following and tracking. Now, Facebook's response is that's an anti-small business thing, right? Because they so presume that people are gonna say, no, I don't wanna be tracked in that way. And Facebook will not address that part of it. But the fact, the, the intrinsic presumption of Facebook's entire political campaign on which they're buying ads in every newspaper is that of course people will say, no, I don't wanna be tracked. So I find that that is trickery, right? That, that must be trickery. It's so, been Malcolm. from the beginning. It's been from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I went to high school with, with somebody like that, that never get in an argument with her because she will just change the whole paradigm like that. And it's, it's, it's a clever way to argue even though it's disingenuous. Um, but I, I think there are five big points here. Um, Rita hit a couple of them, but you know, the, the first is the lag between innovation and legislation. And we are in you know, the middle of that. And hopefully we're gonna come out the other side in the next three to four years, but it takes time for democracies to, to catch up with this stuff. Um, you know, the second though is the Walmart effect that I, I grew up in a small town in the Midwest that there was a very vibrant main street and then boom, Walmart showed up three miles out of town and, and wiped it out. At least in that case, you know, it, it's a big economic discussion, a big moral discussion, but there was a legitimate alternative. You know, Walmart was providing goods and services at a different price point that then freed up money for people to spend or save elsewhere. So there was a legitimate alternative. It's pretty hard to argue the legitimate alternative on this one, but it leads me to the third point. Um, and I keep getting stuck, David, on three hours and 48 minutes. That's what we all spend on these platforms on average every day. And that's a stunning amount of time. And so it's you know, the classic, you know, give the people what they want. Well, 
at least people are voting with their thumbs that this seems to be what they want. But you know, we also wanted cigarettes back in the day. Um, so it's, and it, it leads to the fourth point of just, when we look back, I think we're gonna be horrified. Look no further than teen suicides in the US, particularly with females. It is jumped off the charts. It's two and a half X what it's been, it was very stable for a century. And then in 2012, just went haywire. And there's, I think, fairly no other um, way to describe, you know, wh what is the cause of this? And, um, you know, that's just one of these instances. We're going to look back at many, many of these and think, you know, where were the regulators? Where was society? Where were the adults in the room? Um, and so I think this is going to move pretty quickly uh, over the next few years. And the final one is trust. I mean, what a vast social experiment to Rita's point, but it's such a good point. It's, it's worth doubling down on that, you know, any of these platforms, they know exactly where you are at any moment. They know where you're driving, who you're talking to, what you're researching, what you're thinking. And um, when I was at Davos a couple of years ago, um, you know, we, it's, we, we had a forum um, a pulled together of several people that were pretty deeply entrenched in the AI world. And the most fascinating person in the world was actually the chief digital officer of the UAE. And he was saying, I'm probably the first CDO at a national level in the world, but shared that um, we can look into these platforms and recognize things about people that suddenly run not just against national law, but Sharia law. So what if somebody's clearly a homosexual based upon just their browsing history and their interests? You can see that, but what do we do when we know that, when that's against the law of the land? And so these types of issues that have come, you know, come to the fore with these platforms, clearly these firms have failed in managing and regulating that on their own. And I think you're going to see very aggressive action coming forward in the next several years. Wow, and, and your point about the UAE having first digital officer in a digital government official you know, minister in the world, that's no longer the case by right. far. As a matter of fact, just the other day, I was on a session with the newly named Chief National Transformation Minister of Togo. So, and she had just gotten that job in August. So this is the kind of thing that's happening all over the world in 2020. I mean, some of those people were coming along in the last few years, but every country has had the epiphany. And another epiphany that's happened, which is related to a number of things we're talking about, and we at Tech, I've been talking a lot about the sustainable development goals for years, and it didn't have digital connectivity as one of the goals, crazy. But now the, the, the Secretary General is a huge partisan of connectivity as a central goal as part of the SDGs. So there's, there's changes that have come. Are, are either of you or both able to stay a little past the hour, or do you have to Wrap. Oh. Read it. Malcolm, can you stay to a little longer? Sure. I wanted to bring on uh, Jody Westby if she's, uh, I, she didn't respond when I asked her if she wanted to talk, but I'm letting her talk. She's in our community, probably one of the most knowledgeable people about cyber security. And she had made a comment in the chat about this recent huge attack. And I thought it'd be good to bring her on to make, you know, tie it into our conversation. Are you there, Jody? I'm here, David. Good. Uh, I was asking about the, it, I've been focusing a lot on these cyber attacks that have, we're still trying to determine the scope and depth of them, but 18,000 public and private sector organizations from around the world have potentially been involved with these. Certainly you've seen a lot about our government agencies, but also numerous private sector companies. It was a very um, stealthy and sophisticated attack. We don't know the extent of it, but it's fairly certain that it's gone on for six to nine months where a substantial amount of intellectual property and sensitive data could have been stolen. So we could see, so I asked the question in the midst of operational changes from the pandemic and the potential for loss of market share or competitiveness in the market as a result of, of this um, cyber sabotage, I'll call it, then um, I'm asking, how do you expect companies to react? We've, we've typically had really struggled to get boards to do what they should do for cyber governance. And now it's, it's going to hit them right in the face because they're, they're looking at remote workforces, 
more cyber risks than ever. They've skyrocketed during this period of the pandemic. The Russians were probably less active during the election than we expected because they were busy with all their people on this uh, to the maximum extent possible. What do you expect companies and how do you think boards are going to respond to this? Yeah, uh, Jody, I'm, I'm pretty close to Thanks, this Jody. point. Um, it's great point and great question. Um, our firm got hit by a maze attack um, just six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we up close and personal saw the sophistication of this. Um, and we work with tons of financial services firms, um, it, pharmaceutical, life sciences, healthcare. This is a dramatic issue that everybody's dealing with. So, so I think two quick answers. One is to address it properly. Um, it requires a level of resource that's an order of magnitude higher than most firms devote to it today. Mm -hmm. And so are investors going to allow you to go back to the street and say, I've got to take down earnings by 3% to address this thing that has nothing to do with the customer experience. It has nothing to do with innovation. This is now a corporate tax that was foisted upon me by some bad actors that are 8,000 miles away. So I think that's one point, but I think the larger is this was the year that we created, what is it, Space Force, um, you know, the fifth wing of the military. Um, and it, I think we actually created the wrong wing. That in my view, look, look at the Marines. The Marines were initially started to stop the Barbary pirates. It was to allow the US merchant Marine and keep free trade across the Atlantic when it really mattered. And I think this requires a military and government level response. No company can deal with this uh, with the scale and sophistication which is necessary. And so I think that you do have to have you know, a military wing with military grade capabilities to keep commerce safe the same way that the Marines helped two centuries ago. Well, that's, that's okay. Uh, I just saw a question in the, uh, in the side that I'd like to go to because I think in some ways it ties together a lot of what we're talking about. John, uh, identify yourself and, and say what you were saying in the chat there. Hi, uh, I'm John Ziegler. I'm a Midwesterner as well. I have a little uh, healthcare startup company, a tech company. Um, my question had to do with building trust. You guys talked about this a lot, but building trust among people that um, that data is valuable in delivering basically facts that run contrary to years of assumptions. Um, I was saying that I think it's fair to say that in most of our human existence, our access to data had been limited and therefore, uh, those that made the best arguments supporting conclusions uh, drawn from limited facts were the leaders and their conclusions became fact. Now in the world of less, those that are less educated, uh, they probably, and have less access to data fall into the camp that is more likely to believe uh, that data goes against their assumptions. Well, how can we get that whole core group of people to trust that this, this whole new world, this digital world that can have access to data and bring uh, the opportunity to ask new questions and come up with great new answers that might run contrary to our assumptions is the way to go. I think that's kind of a brilliantly phrased question myself. Do, do either of our panelists or Drew, any of you want to say anything about that? Uh, I've got some thoughts, but Rita, Drew? Uh, sure. So I think the first issue that I think you're reflecting is, you know, I, I used to believe in rational man, you know, that, that that's what they taught us, uh, right? That you gather all the data and then you see what the data tell you and you make decisions. Um, the more I work, like in the world of organizations, the more I've come to believe that we basically select a story we like and then we go look for data that reinforces that story. And that, that I don't think has to do with your level of education. I think it has to do with, um, you know, how we, how we as human beings sort of process. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing, one of the things I work on all the time in innovation is, you know, it's a high uncertainty thing. So how do you learn? And what we try to be super careful about is let's, this is what we assume about the world. 
this is the way we're going to test those assumptions. When we learn something new, we're going to change our assumptions. And so I think there's an awful lot of, of showing people how to do that in a structured way before they're so far down the road that it's got to be, no, I'm right, you're wrong. And there's, there's nothing basically that can be done to shift my thinking. Um, so I think it's teaching people how to do that, um, making it acceptable not to have all the answers. Um, and being willing to take small steps on the basis of unclear data. Yeah, and you know, it's a great minds think alike. I was gonna say, Ray, your first point, you know, we, this is the age of data, but we are wired for anecdote. Yeah. And it's just- <laughs> That's a great quote. Know, that's the problem. <laughs> and you know, for me personally, what helped, and it sort of blew my mind, was getting to know uh, Duolingo well as a company. And I don't know if folks know Duolingo, but you know, I, I grew up studying French and it, it was beyond brutal. I, it's my grade point just got absolutely crushed by my French grades. Um, and I, it, it never worked for me. And, you know, it, Duolingo, it's interesting. They, they have now cracked the code on how humans and particularly adults learn foreign languages. And the way we've been teaching for the past hundred years is totally wrong, a hundred percent wrong. So when you start with conjugating, you know, je suis, tu es, you know, blah, 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 wrong. It's, that's not how you should approach it. And so it was helpful, at least for me personally, to understand how um, we have to do things very, very differently. Um, um, but you have to live through that personally through an example like that to then extrapolate and see where that applies elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know we got to wrap up. My only thought there- We've got uh, another minute or two. Yeah, I mean, in this day and age, at least in terms of how the consumer consumes it, Data is essentially information to me. And in terms of the threats on um, institutions, fake news, right? There's this, there's this threat of the institution that's sort of the validity of information and being able to trust information, trust institutions. To me, data is no different, at least in terms of when it's filtered or massaged or spun or whatever and then pushed out to the consumer. So to me, the, the, the integrity of data is, you know, and where we are, it's just as dangerous in terms of what we've done with sort of information and news and institutions. And I think AI is great, and but it, it, it's only so great if, if it's meant for the benefit of a consumer or meant for the benefit of a citizen. It's only so great if the citizen is ready to trust that data and that information, right? And I don't know how we sort of work ourselves through that in terms of I will lay it on uh, a lot on the prior administration. We won't get into that in terms of sort of taking this thing around information and news and trusting, you know, vaccines, right? Here we go, right? So we trust the vaccine, even though the data is telling us that it's very safe. Um, but, you know, that data is being spun a different way as information that's being consumed by the citizenry in a variety of different ways. I mean, to me, they're all linked, data and information. This, this connects to a, a pet theory of mine that I'm still working on. So if it sounds half-baked, apologies in advance. But, you know, I often ask, how, what could possibly remedy this information divide where these fundamentally different sets of facts are, are, are being accepted by different communities in society at a, at a, you know, really schismatic sort of way? And I often think business has a potential to be a remedy for that, because in business, Facts absolutely provably matter. There is a bottom line. You cannot be a conspiracy-based business person and succeed. It will not work, right? So the point about data and the point about the bottom line are closely related in my mind that if you're a data-based institution, you're gonna come to conclusions that are more reliably societally responsible maybe is the term. Um, and, and then I asked, well, how could we ever agree on data at a societal level? You know, then I asked, we have, there's a blockchain thing that's happening in the background as a sort of provable set of, uh, you know, systems for proving the derivation of data. Uh, maybe there's a connection. I don't know. I'm just throwing it all out there. Um, maybe I've just put gone way over the deep end. But Malcolm, have I just gone over the deep end? No, you haven't. And look, I, I think there's a dividing line right now between um, how people are educated either in the social sciences or in STEM. So a STEM mind, you are taught there is an answer. There is truth. You go into the social sciences and you hear this term that popped up in the last decade, which is my truth. Like, what, what in the hell is it? You, what, what do you mean your truth? It's, <laughs> but it, it's, allowed people to interpret things in through many, many different lenses and then come up with their conclusions. So 
yeah. you know, it's this fight of empiricism versus opinion. And you're right, David. Alternative, you know, alternative it, facts, right? Now. Right. But it, it, David's right. I mean, if, if there's an upside of capitalism that you will be punished if you don't get close to truth very quickly. Um, and, and I would just note, Jack, who was on with us before, uh, put in the chat, says this, the whole audience can't see it. But Enron WorldCom, Arthur Anderson confirmed the business numbers, business disabused our trust. True, but look at what happened to all three of those they're organizations. All gone. Yeah, really, gone. really <laughs> were dramatically punished by their failure to pay, pay attention to what were facts. And when the facts proved to contradict them, they were really screwed. Um, but uh, I, I saw Diane Brady in the background and I really wanted to just hear anything from her. So in hopes that she, even though she didn't seem to wanna to talk, uh, this is our last, we're gonna wrap up. But if Diane has anything to say, any observations, I'd love to hear them. Diane is a great longtime journalist at Business Week and plenty of other places and co-author of John Chambers' most recent book, et cetera. So Diane, any observations to help us wrap up here? I was just telling my son how much I love David Kirkpatrick. How's that for an observation? No, I, you know, I go back to the, I, like that. I go back to the K-shaped recovery that we talked about at the, or you talked about at the beginning, because I think about that a lot. And um, I know a lot of people here in Brooklyn, where I live, um, feel like they're on the losing end of that equation. So I'm just curious about, you know, a lot of creative people in this community and they're just really hurting. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to be optimistic about 2021, but then I, I look around, I don't see a lot of opportunities for jazz musicians, for artists, for a lot of people who to me are the glue that hold us all together. Well, thank you. That's a, an interesting and different point of view. And <laughs> reflections on that or any other closing thoughts from, from, from any of you, including Drew, because um, let's, we, we do have to, we have, we've, we have gone over our, our normal time, but we thought because of this wide ranging discussion, we might want to go a little extra. So thank you, Diane. Thank you. Anybody? So yeah, I'll jump in. I'm, I'm on the board of a local arts organization and um, co-chair of their strategy committee of all things. And it's it's what Diane was saying is that, you know, it's a, a world of hurt out there for people in those roles. Now, I think the mistake is, and this is applies to those folks, but also to all of us. I think the mistake is to snap back and say, it's gonna go back to where it was and that's normal uh, because whatever comes next is not gonna be normal. And I think if you try to be that, that previous, thing, you know, whether it's a Broadway singer or whatever, um, that may not be the path forward, but there are all kinds of new paths opening up. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the sad part is we're going to lose some of these things and they're not going to come back and then, but there are going to be new things that come in and replace them. And can we figure out a way of, of helping people to access those? Malcolm, on that or any other topic to help us wrap up? Yeah, I just think in, in with, with that and sort of a closing thought, um, that you know, personally, I often just turn off my engines after a year during the holidays and just stare at the fire and think about nothing. Um, I think this is a year where we all have to think about something because 2020 is a consequential year and it is, to Rita's point, a true strategic inflection point. And it is for all of us individually. So if you just don't pay attention and go through the motions, you could be on the wrong side of the K. So I think to get on the right side of the K, you know, use the holidays to have the right conversations, really be pensive, think through what are the three things that you should do differently in January to ensure you're on the right side of the K. Well, that's a nice big picture philosophic way, moral thought almost. Uh, Drew. Yeah, no, and I guess my closing thought would be, and anyone who watches me on here knows I'm the eternal optimist. Um, you know, I saw Danny Meyer on, on CNBC the other day, and granted, he's in a he's in a in a financially comfortable position to say this and be encouraging and say, out of all whether it's the the, the Great Recession or difficult times, particularly economic times, what always happens is you do see a great rebirth. And and he was talking about rational rents and entrepreneurs and restaurateurs, and he thinks the next six months is the best time in his lifetime to open a restaurant. Now, obviously, that is looking at a post-pandemic type of world. And, and whether it's startups, I, I, I lived through being in sort of the internet digital media business all my life. I lived through, obviously, the crash in 2000. Interestingly, saw that from Wall Street and Madison Avenue. And what happened after sort of the internet crashed in 2000? Well, there was a great many companies who still believed in the internet as a powerful 
medium tool platform to reach consumers that great companies were started. So I, I'm always the optimist and sort of, this has been a horrible time. We have some darkness ahead, but these, this also creates great opportunity as well. So um, I, I'm, I'm excited about seeing that, um, even though the institutions don't seem to be necessarily prepared to help us with that. But um, the, Thanks, entrepreneur will be, the entrepreneur will be the entrepreneur. And our owner, Jim McCann, the founder of 1-800-Flowers, is a believer that second half, third, last quarter at least, last two, third of 2021 is going to be a huge economic boom. That's his belief. People are going to be so eager to get out of this. They're going to just like be creative and productive and everything. My own observation, and I have a piece I'm trying to write maybe for next week, that 2020 was the year that the world really finally became techonomic. And so to me, the, this question of how do we adapt to a truly digital society is to me my big point that I am musing on wrestling with and our company and our, our programs will continue wrestling with. And just related to that, we, Josh and I and, and others in the company have been talking a lot about a set of programs for next year, uh, maybe other kinds of media on the theme of uh, digitally divided as a sort of macro, and we're trying to come up with a tagline to make it a little less grim because so there's maybe a positive spin on the, on the subhead. But anyway, thank you everybody. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Rita. Thank you for adapting to a slightly uh, unexpected uh, format today uh, and, and really, really enjoyed the discussion. Got a lot of great comments in the chat too. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful holiday season and a great happy holidays, year. everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks again.